Welcome back, everybody, for the second stretch of talks on this amazing day of React Everything. I hope the coffee helped in revitalizing your spirits, refocusing your attention for the, for the next speaker. It's, uh, the man is a pretty well-known face in, uh, in our Amsterdam scene. He has been doing many talks in the past at various meetups and conferences in the region. He's an Italian guy living in Holland, working on Balsamic, the wireframing app. Uh, Stefano, come up on stage. You can connect your, um, your laptop while I'm introducing you. Um, yeah, he's been working with a um, pretty seriously uh, cutting edge stack for their new, um, new app. React, Redux, Relay, GraphQL, Node, Redis, running on AWS, and using Convox to deploy the thing. So I think, like Jessica in the previous talk, this is going to be a talk of some war stories, sharing what he has done to make all this happen, and especially GraphQL and Relay, how that, what the state of, his, of that technology is nowadays in a real-life web application. Please give it up for Stefano Massini. Thank you. Hello. So, yeah, my name is uh, Stefano. And, uh, yeah, I'm the only one in Balsamic living here in the Netherlands. We are all uh, work uh, remotely. Um, what I'm, the title of my talk used to be uh, about Relay, but then uh, I realized it was more about GraphQL, so sorry about the last minute change. Um, yeah, just to give, to give it away really quickly, uh, it's been awesome. So, um, just out of, out of curiosity, uh, how many people here know, I mean, have heard about GraphQL? All right, uh, keep your hands up if you've used GraphQL somehow, and if now, keep it up if you've used it in production. All right, those are just way too few hands because GraphQL is really cool. So um, you should definitely uh, check it out. So let me tell you a little bit about GraphQL just really quickly. Um, it's, first of all, it's an alternative to REST. So it's a, a different way to fetch uh, data from the server to, to the client. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, space efficient on the network because it's the client that asks the server specifically what information needs to be uh, returned. And so it's not like you have a normal entry point and you get a, a big blob of information regardless. You, the client can specify, and so it's efficient on the network. Um, but it also turns out to be a really nice way to specify the data requirements of your uh, React components. Um, and it also turns out to be uh, also a nice way to organize the code on the server. So I will show you a little bit of that um, later. Um, so this is what a query looks like. Um, basically, it's, you know, the best way to describe it is just a, a JSON without the values. And so, um, yeah, so this is the way a query looks like. And the response looks like, you know, the filled up JSON. So you get the information back from the server, exactly what you asked for. And so um, GraphQL is built around uh, uh, three major uh, concepts. One is uh, a query, which is the way to read information from the server. One is a mutation, which is a way to write uh, to a server and change the server side state of the application, um, kind of like a remote procedure call. Uh, and then um, the recent, most recent addition is subscription, which is a way to, for the server to send push uh, notification, push events to, to the client. And just to make sure, to be clear, uh, GraphQL is just a transport layer. Um, it's just a way to exchange information uh, data with the server. Um, then you still have the problem of dealing with the application uh, state. Um, and for that, there are libraries like Relay uh, or Apollo. And since just a couple of days, <laughs> Relay Modern, uh, they just announced a new version of Relay and they called it Modern. So now you have Relay Classic and Relay Modern. Uh, it's zero 
or 1.0. Uh, it's just a new version. Um, and these libraries take care of um, allowing you to specify the component data requirements your, uh, or uh, your React components and dealing with the communication so you don't have to refetch if the server wasn't answering for some reason, and caching, most importantly. So, you know, this is just, you know, a really quickly, uh, really quick introduction to uh, what uh, GraphQL um, is and in the ecosystem around it. Uh, but do look it up because it's really interesting. Now, uh, back to the story of this talk. Uh, as I said, I work at Balsamic, and so um, you, may know, um, you may know our tool, which is a tool for creating wireframes. And um, uh, this is typically a desktop application, what most people um, know us for. Uh, but some of you may know that we have an online version of it that's called MyBalsamic. Um, we've been busy in the past year and a half. Well, we, we rewrote the whole thing in JavaScript because it used to be Flash. Uh, so that's the biggest effort, um, something that uh, my other colleagues are talking about in other conferences, also very nice talks, um, about how we rewrote the whole thing. But what I'm talking about today is the effort of uh, writing a new online application, uh, Balsamic application, which is this one. Uh, it's called Balsamic Cloud. And it's um, basically a metadata container. It's a place where you can put your uh, balsamic projects. And so you have a way to store your projects. And then if you click on the projects, you can actually edit them with the editor that you're familiar with uh, in the browser. Um, and then you can collaborate on the project. So uh, you also have uh, people uh, in your site. So you have a site, we have people, we have projects, uh, and then of course we have um, a site settings where you can set, you know, the, the name of the site. Uh, a site can have multiple owners. Uh, so it's, it's a, that kind of application. Um, just, you know, a container for projects. Um, so just to give you a few numbers, uh, uh, we're talking about 26,000 lines of code. Uh, but the actual editor, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that you can use for editing the mockups um, is 130K. So, not, you know, not too big, not too small. It's an interesting size. Um, there are about 30 external dependencies, uh, actual libraries that provide uh, some um, feature that we really needed. Um, but then somehow we ended up listing in package JSON 150 modules, which blows up to a whooping 860 uh, modules when uh, you install in node modules. You know, that's the world we live in. We all know that. Um, 200 React components uh, uh, spread around 50 uh, files. Um, 32 GraphQL mutations, so it's 32 different ways you can change the data on the server. Um, 25 events, um, and then we have about 80% coverage of the server-side code with uh, 120 integration tests. So this is our setup. And let's see a little bit about the architecture. So uh, the whole thing runs on AWS, and uh, in order to make sense of this crazy set of uh, uh, services they provide. We use a tool that's called Convox. If you don't know it, look it up. It's interesting. Um, it's, it's a nice way to make sense of all the mess. Um, then we have a GraphQL entry point, of course, the, the main uh, entry point to our application, which builds on top of a schema. So if you don't know GraphQL, that's, that's what you write. A schema is what you write in order to provide a, um, a feature. Um, and then uh, the resolvers of the schema hit on the database uh, going through a Redis cache. Uh, we, make use, uh, we make heavy use of the cache. If it's warm, we don't expect many, many hits to the database for read operations. Um, and we like to keep separate uh, the definition, the part of the schema that defines read, you know, properties that you want to read from, from the mutations, which are the, you know, the, the, the writes that have side effects. Uh, we like to keep them separate uh, in separate files. Uh, it's nice to have you know, in your code base a clear separation of uh, the portion of the code base that is only read uh, and the portion that has uh, side effects. Um, another thing that we like is, uh, just like in a good uh, old C language, programming language, um, where you have the .h file, which describes the types, and then the .c file, which describes the implementation. Uh, similarly, we like to separate um, the mutations into the type definition itself uh, and separate it from the actual implementation. So we, we call the implementation operations. Um, because that's what they do, they operate on something. 
And we have, uh, it's nice to have them separate also because not only you, can you call them from the GraphQL entry point, but you can also call them from uh, uh, other uh, HTTP entry points, um, which we do, for example, when you, uh, you know, accept an invitation. So you have a URL, you click, and that's what happens on the server side. Um, and the operations is actually where the, the real meat is, of course. That's where uh, we actually write to the database or send a, an email or, you know, deal with the payment process or send out notification, this kind of stuff. So this is the overall architecture. And in general, it's been, everything has been developed according to uh, the hexagonal architecture, uh, which is a pattern. Um, if, you don't, if you don't know it, look it up, it's interesting. Um, it's basically um, a pattern uh, built around the concept that if you have an external uh, library, an external dependency, you only ever import that library in one module. Um, and that module simply provides, implements a, a little wrapper around the um, external library API to provide an internal API. So uh, you make a little point of indirection um, between your code and, and the library so that if the library changes, you know, upgrades or whatever, you figure out it's not adequate, you want to change it, uh, you only have to rewrite the adapter and then the rest of the application keeps using the same internal API. It's really nice. Uh, it works, uh, worked really well for us. We have about 19 adapters in cloud. Um, and we wrapped everything uh, from authentication, caching, database, logging, you name it. So we don't have, um, we don't, all of these dependencies are only in one place in the code base. If we want to swap out the, the, the library for one of those uh, features, we just replace that single module. And those adapters are made available uh, through the rest of the application through uh, dependency injection. So instead of relying on import statements, uh, uh, we mostly rely on uh, parameters being passed into functions. Um, and these instances are made available through the GraphQL context. So let me show you a little bit of code. Don't be intimidated bah! by uh, this uh, amount of code. You don't have to understand this. Um, also because it looks very similar to uh, what you find in the um, in the, uh, in the examples you've read about uh, GraphQL. Um, basically, um, it's a type definition. This is what um, is a project uh, in our schema. And so you can see a list of fields. Uh, these are the fields that are, that are accessible uh, through the GraphQL schema. And basically, uh, this is just a way to define the type um, and the resolver. So in order to get, for example, the thing that's called properties, there's a function that's called a resolver, and which is this one. Um, and what, what you need, just need to notice here is that even though this is a function, it could, could have been like this big, um, we decided to make it less short because of the same reason I said before. We like to keep the definition of the type separate from the implementation. So inside the, the type definition, we just uh, place one function call. And we just wrapped it with this little uh, thingy that we created. It's called a resolve with logger. It's just a utility function that uh, intercepts uh, maybe exceptions and report them in a nicer way than uh, the you know, uh, bare-bone library would have, uh, would have done otherwise. Just utility. Um, so this is uh, what our type definition looks like. This is what a mutation looks like. Uh, this is uh, indeed a little bit different than um, uh, what you see in the documentation. Um, of Relay, for example, because uh, we leverage a naming convention um, with uh, this little uh, helper function up here. Um, we have, as I said, we have a convention in our code base uh, where we like to keep the definition of the type separate from the implementation, and we call the implementation operations. So basically, we have uh, one directory that contains JavaScript files called mutations. It contains JavaScript files that define the mutations, and then a different directory called operations with files of the same name uh, that contain implementation functions. And so this is, you know, as magic as it gets. Uh, we just uh, leverage, like to leverage this naming convention with that utility function. Something useful we found to, to write a little bit less code. Uh, if there's one thing that uh, I've, you know, people mm, sometimes complain about Relay and GraphQL is that it's uh, a little verbose. Uh, so this is just a little way we found to uh, write a little bit less code. Um, this is what an operation looks like. Again, uh, don't try to make sense of it. Just uh, notice that uh, these are the uh, adapters. Uh, this is dependency injection, right? So we pass a lot of adapters into the functions because uh, that's how we use them down there. 
so we just place method calls uh, on those adapters. So for example, you will not see like SQL code in this function because SQL belongs to the realm of the database. And so uh, just like everything else, it's been wrapped in its own adapter. It's nice to have one single place in the code base with all the SQL there. If you want to optimize, that's, that's the place to go. So instead of having it scattered around, uh, so that's a, that's a nice thing we, we found out. This is another um, uh, topic about uh, how we write uh, these operations. So this is just a couple of sanity checks that throw errors. And we learned that for throwing errors, um, instead of just raising an exception, uh, we raise a little bit smarter kind of exception that has three pieces of information. One is a simple text for the user. So uh, something that actually is shown in the UI and uh, that's just uh, used to indicate the next step. Uh, it could even be like write to customer support, you know? So it shouldn't contain any detail be, to not to scare the user away or any sh also to not give away too much information to malicious users. So no internal IDs, nothing like that. Um, that belongs to a second piece of information, a string that only goes to the server logs. Um, there you must be as detailed as possible because it, you know, it's useful for debugging. Um, and then um, finally, uh, a unique error code, which is a string that goes together with the first one uh, to the customer. And we find this useful because when they write support, they cut and paste the error. And so it's nice for us to see exactly in the code uh, what triggered the error. We make sure that these are unique. So um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is reactivity. Um, and React, reactivity, reactive are all uh, very popular words this day. Uh, the meaning I'm, I'm talking about today is uh, when you're looking at a, at a site, a page of an application um, that contains information, and some of that information has changed the, from another uh, browser, from another uh, user, whatever, you expect that page to update, right? So this is the kind of things I'm talking about. So let's make an example. For example, let's say that uh, we want to um, change the user avatar. I have two browser tabs in my uh, application, and uh, from one, I change my own uh, user avatar. So I'm expecting the other uh, browser tab to display the new image. So uh, how, do, how do we go about doing that? Of course, we need some sort of... Uh, um, you know, WebSocket uh, to channel events from the server, right? Something like that. So um, one naive way to approach that is uh, that, you know, the client sends a mutation on my second, uh, on my second uh, tab to change the user avatar. And then the server changes the avatar and then sends an event on the application channel that my React components listen to. So when they mount, they listen to these events. And when uh, they see an event, they force fetch. Force fetch is uh, the mechanism from, uh, for uh, relay to uh, just reload, force reloading the information from the server. And uh, it's a way to just you know, force um, updating every, everything. So that, of course, works. Because uh, if you implement it this way, your whole application will just uh, reload the whole thing. And so, of course, it works. Um, then. Um, if you want to do better, then uh, we can um, have more specific events. So instead of firing a generic event, we fire a user avatar changed event um, so that our components can actually listen. So the user avatar component will actually listen to the um, user avatar changed um, event instead of every possible event. So that limits the amount of force fetches. Another way is to have narrower channels. So instead of having a generic application channel, we can have a user channel uh, that's specific to, to myself. And so uh, that user avatar changed uh, event is sent through my uh, user channel. And so only, my, um, only the user avatar component will listen to that channel. And so uh, that will also limit the, the number of force fetches. But if you start to think about this in your application, this quickly becomes a hairy mess because um, it's about uh, the inherent complexity of your application. So, for example, let's take a look at this page. As I said, a site can have multiple owners, right? And owners are also users. So if one of those users, so this site specifically has two, two owners. If one of those users changes their name, I'm expecting this page to update, right? So what does it look like? So this is our page, you know, simplified. Um, as we said, you know, the user avatar is just listening to the user channel. If I change user avatar on the server, then I fire an event on that channel, and therefore the user avatar updates. Now, 
um, talking about these two uh, guys over here, these two combo boxes. Now, they will have to listen to the channel of the user that they're currently uh, showing, right? And so when uh, on the server uh, I get a change username uh, action uh, mutation, then I just, uh, the server will just fire an event on the channel of that user, and that will solve the problem um, because the UI can actually update. But then, if you, th if you think about it, this is this quite complicated on UI because it means that those combo boxes will have to listen to, register to that channel, uh, but then if I change the user on the combo box, I have to deregister for that channel, register again to another user channel. It's, it's, got, you know, it's not very nice. Uh, so a better way to, to deal with this is maybe, maybe, having on, uh, maybe having on UI a channel for the page for example. And so this is a site, so we can have you know, a, a site channel, for example. And so uh, we can just assume that the server will send the relevant events and will only listen to that channel. Um, of course, this is pushing the complexity to the server now, uh, because when I change the username, I fire the event uh, on the user channel. But if that user also happens to be an owner of the site, then I have to also send an event on that site's channel. Right? So you see that we're just moving the complexity from the UI to the server. But I claim that I think this kind of complexity is better, uh, it's better to have it on the server than the, than the UI. It's better to keep the UI simple. So, um, you know, just to wrap up uh, about this, this reactivity topic, um, we know that uh, Relay Classic, which is the relay that we have out there, doesn't provide any, uh, doesn't provide any solution out of the box. You have to, run, uh, to you know, implement your own thing, uh, PubSub uh, uh, plus ForceFetch, like we did, uh, which is a solution, but it's inefficient because ForceFetch is not a nice way to, uh, to, to deal with this. Um, just because it's, um, it, it, there's just too many round trips to the server. You get the event and then you go back to the server to fetch again. So three round trips instead of one. Um, Relay Modern uh, and Apollo is that provide GraphQL subscriptions, which are a much better way to deal with this because uh, it's, uh, you can specify exactly what events you want to listen to and exactly what information you want to get back from uh, the server when these events are fired. So it's an improvement over force fetch. Um, but it's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, new stuff. Uh, live queries is a promising topic, but it's still an open discussion, so we don't know. Basically, the, the, the bottom line is that if this is an inherent complexity. Uh, you somehow have to deal with it. Um, the tooling that is out there that is getting uh, more and more mature is only helping us to solve the UI part, um, which is good. Uh, but keep in mind that this stuff is, is uh, complex, inherently complex. Now, a um, couple of words about testing, uh, something else we're really happy about, um, and it, we think that GraphQL is really uh, well suited for. So our tests look like, uh, very simply, the, start, the test starts, then we regenerate the whole database on a real instance, a local instance of the database, go through the setup phases, um, then we send a, a GraphQL request, uh, the server answers, we check the results, and then uh, go through a cleanup, destroy the database, and go on with the next test. So you would say, you know, this could be quite expensive because it goes through an actual database with real, uh, you know, the real code that hits the real database and real cache. We only mock the uh, external services like sending an email or notifications and that kind of stuff because we don't care about testing those uh, APIs. But really, this only runs uh, in 200 milliseconds per test. And we have 120 tests that run in less than 30 seconds. For integration testing, this is really good. We're really happy. And it gives us a lot of confidence that uh, we don't have major uh, bugs in the server. So um, also look it up. GraphQL is really good for uh, testing. Um, now, we were really happy about um, this project because it was starting uh, from scratch. It was a greenfield project. And so the first thing we started to do was look out you know, what was available on the space of the newer libraries one year, one, uh, one year and a half ago when we started. And you find a lot of stuff that claim you, know, uh, you to be uh, productive with uh, cool um, solutions like uh, naming conventions uh, so that you have to write less code, default behaviors, less configuration, um, automatic stuff here and there like caching and you don't have to think about that and maybe you have an ORM I don't know there's lots of uh, lots of interesting um, cool 
you know, uh, libraries out there and frameworks that, that are really advanced because the writing this stuff is not easy and really cool. But uh, this all belongs to the realm of magic. Um, and I don't like magic because when I write something that I want to maintain for, a, you know, possibly a long time, I tend to forget uh, the code and, and especially the magic. When I go back to my code that I wrote six months ago and there's some magic in it, I, it, it inevitably gets in the way. So I rather prefer the code to be unsurprising and predictable as much as possible. So, you know, welcome boilerplate if that means, you know, I will not uh, be surprised. Um, explicit configuration is good. Um, caching is, is a hard beast, so you have to bite the bullet. Um, and um, plain SQL, why not? Uh, it's you know, much easier to, uh, to, to optimize. Um, so this is all stuff that is you know, normally considered uninteresting and repetitive, uh, but it's safe. So um, I would rather go safe, um, safe uh, than sorry. So the bottom line, I guess, is uh, you have to be cool because you know, Relay and GraphQL and this kind of stuff is really cool technology, but play safe. Uh, you know, adopt sound engineering principles and uh, yeah, that was it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. Thank you very much for taking away some of the fear, uh, uncertainty, and doubt around GraphQL for us. Um, I would suggest we have time for one single short question, uh, and then we have to move on. In the front. I'm happy to talk about GraphQL anyway, uh, all the time, so just find me. Hi. I would like to know, what do you use to translate um, GraphQL query to SQL? Um, there, there's no direct translation. Uh, GraphQL doesn't uh, provide, uh, it's just a way to um, structure your entry point in your application. So you know what the client queries, you know what the client wants, but then how to fetch that information is totally up to you. So you can, you know, if you have, a, you can conceive, for example, an ORM system that uh, automatically uh, takes your database schema and makes it available as a GraphQL um, entry point. That could be an exercise, an interesting exercise. But in a, in a real world application, I think uh, you have, it's better if, if you just write all the steps and, uh, and go and make the query. So we have nothing magic in there. We just have really uh, plain SQL queries that fetch the data that's needed. Then you have to be careful about not overfetching and not going to the database too often. So there's a very nice uh, library that's called Data Loader that prevents uh, that, that you know it makes it easier for uh, you know, just, uh, more efficient. So look it up. But thank yeah, you. It's an interesting topic. Thanks. Thank you, Stefano. One last warm round of applause for Stefano.